So with the background ambience of this music from the Van Nuys Top 10 again, I have a quote for you. Patience is a virtue, even in an airplane. It's a Chad quote, we'll get to it today. But I figured what better backdrop to use for an ethical discussion with our favorite resident turbine instructor, Chad Fortenberry, right? So today, it's round two deep dives into higher level training topics that'll hopefully be relevant to you no matter where you are in your aviation journey. And you know what, if you're early on, then listen extra closely because hopefully taking in Chad's advice today will get you further faster and save you a whole lot of grief. Also money. Now, you all know I don't like to ruin the ending, but just in case you were thinking of moving on, well, here's what we're going to talk about today. Energy management. That's a big one. Stabilized approaches. They're not optional. How to think ahead of the airplane. The rule of three and how many different ways you can apply it, how to really do a checklist properly and easily, changing your perspective, and why becoming a CFI is a bridge to becoming a real pro. And we have a listener question that's air traffic control related from patron Hans Cathcart. It's safe to say we got a lot to cover, so I'm gonna quit yapping and let's get to it. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, lest people think that we're just going to talk about this like, oh, turboprops and jets and, you know, forget about everyone. You know, even if you're flying a Cessna 152, I had actually one of the most sort of poignant examples of this with a student of mine who was not a student. Actually, this person was prepping for an airline interview. And I'm really glad that we were able to talk about this and catch it before this person went. And I also have it somewhat regularly with another individual that I fly with that sometimes is really cool and gives me a leg to fly or at least an approach and a landing. But uh, even if you're in a single engine piston aircraft, right, I see all the time that somebody will be a little bit fast on final, might be five knots, might be 20, you know, I don't know. But let's say we're out on a three mile final and you're just a little bit fast, right? Well, I see all the time that somebody will be on the glide path and they say, oh, I'm fast. And what do they do? They pull up. Well, Yes, that will solve the speed problem. I mean, it will do that, yes. But what it also does is it ruins your glide path and your stabilized approach, which is actually another, I hate to say, oft forgotten key point or key pillar of you landing. And you have to have a stabilized approach or else you're looking at a go around. Now, if you're in a Cessna or or any single engine piston, not to pick on Cessna, but on a three mile final and you're 10 knots fast, well, guess what? You can probably solve that by pulling the power back to idle, which you may or may not be out already, on glide path and just holding it there. Because the airplane itself, you know, we can make the joke here, is kind of a flying speed break itself. You can slow down to get into flap speed, and especially in like a 172 where you get that first uh, first notch of flaps up to 110, you can add that, keep the glide path with the power idle, and it will in fact slow down. Now, obviously, if you're getting within you know, too close to the ground, too close to the runway, and you still haven't gotten your final flaps in, then yes, you should go around. But the problem is people set up, you know, they'll trade one problem for another. And and like you said, this can be even people that are CFIs that were taught incorrectly or, you know, getting up into the, the thousands of hours that, hey, I'm too fast, I need to slow down. Well, that that's a noble pursuit, but at the same time, you've just completely blown the glide path and the stabilized approach. And even if you do stabilize it, which you probably will, Well, now you're just stuck on a really high glide slope and you're kind of just bearing down on the airport instead of the nice path that was provided for you. So you can almost always solve it just by reducing the power, but keeping that proper glide path to the airport and trying to get the flaps in. And if you don't, okay, we'd go around. But often, maybe not often, but at least a couple of times, I've been, you know, given the leg to fly from the right seat with the owner operator. And I will see this individual sort of cringing over there, like, you're, you're too fast, you're too fast. And I, I mean, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm managing the energy, so I'm going to get that last notch of flaps in right on kind of short final, just like you would at maybe a DA on an ILS, for instance. But I'm on left base from five miles out. So I'm planning, though, to use the addition of the little bit of Gs in that turn from base to final. And the fact that I've been watching that, as we talked about in a technically advanced aircraft, you have an airspeed trend indicator right next to the tape and it's got just a little bit of a downward trend so i'm watching my speed slowly bleed off i know that i'm going to add my flaps on the schedule and i know that i'm going to make a nice 90 degree turn which will help me bleed off some more speed and so forth and by the time we roll out it on final and we're crossing where the da would be i've got that final notch of flaps in i've hardly touched the power at all and we glide into a nice landing right in the touchdown zone but he was cringing the whole time thinking i wasn't going to slow down but this is also the same person that will say, I'm a little bit fast, 
chop the power, pull up, and then always is dive bombing the runway, like nine out of 10 times. So this energy management thing, I mean, it can be anything, you know, forget about challengers and citation tens. It, it works the same way in a 152. You just have more drag to play with, so it makes it a little bit easier. But the idea of sacrificing another important pillar of a stabilized approach in order to get another one back, we need to be really, really careful about that as CFI is teaching early on students that that's probably not a trade you want to make. You know, that's exactly right, uh, Brandon. And I've got a, a, uh, a saying that goes with that whole situation, and this is what I tell people. Patience is a virtue, even in an airplane. And if you're patient and you're on glide slope, it will slow down. But you've got to have the you've got to have the confidence to just wait on it. And guess what? That three degrees or two point eight or whatever you're on uh, for a if you're on Pappy or if you're on an ILS glide slope and you're just you know you're shooting the approach because that's what you wanted to do and it's BFR out and everything. You just let that thing slow down and it'll slow down eventually. Yeah. And, you know, one more tower controller perspective thing here that I see all the time is I'll, I'll see a lot of aircraft, particularly 172s, and actually really particularly the old ones where you don't have that 110 notch flaps 10 setting. You know, you had to get it all the way down on the white arc to even add the first 10, like the old M's and N's and U's and all those. Uh, people will be teaching to fly an ILS, and I know I'm, I'm probably going to get 100 emails on this one, but to fly an ILS with the flaps clean, particularly you know, since they're used to probably having a jet behind them here in Southern California airspace, and they're always telling you to go as fast as you can. And I get that. But then they'll get to the DA, and they'll either do a no-flap landing or maybe flaps 10 at best, land even in a 172 well past the touchdown zone or about halfway down the runway, sort of that cutoff that we should all have, you know, for less than, say, 6,000-foot runway, you know, halfway or the first 3,000, whichever is less, you got to touch down there, and just go coasting past the midfield exits and you know right on down to one of the far exits of the runway which is several more thousand feet down as a controller you sort of you know grinds my gears because i've got somebody that i either want to depart because i've got one runway or somebody on short funnel behind them and then here they go missing the exit that would have been easy to make had you been configured properly right so i get it sometimes in the older cessnas it's a little different but you know in anything particularly the the r's and on that you get that 110 notch uh first 10 degree setting there, there's no reason not to be flying down to the DA. And even if you fly right down there with flaps at 10, going 90 or 100 knots or whatever, you, you know, you like to fly in your 172 in the ILS, as soon as you pop out, and let's just call it 200 feet, you've got your approach lights, you're going to eventually get the pappy, hopefully, if you're continuing the approach to land. If you do basically nothing, like you said, you just got to be confident enough to wait. There it is. Okay, the runway's in front of me like I thought. I have my flaps at 10. And you just do nothing you would fly that pappy at 90 knots right onto the runway. Now, of course, we can't really land a 172 at 90 knots. It'll just keep floating forever. But if you pull that power, you should already be, say you're fully approach at 90, you're only five knots above what it takes to get the whole rest of your flaps, right? So if you just get to the DA, see the runway, pull the power a little bit, not even all the way, and do nothing, it'll slow down a little bit. You just stay on pappy now as you transition to visual, get that next notch almost immediately. And then at the very least, you're landing with flaps at 20 or 25 if you're in a Piper. And you can probably even get the final notch. But if you're off the power, gliding on the pappy slope, and it flaps 20, well, I guarantee you, you may even have to re-add some power, right? But I see that dance where people say 200, there it is, I got it, yank the power, pull up, lose the glide slope, dump the flaps, dive bomb the runway, bounce, 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 or better yet, don't touch the flaps and just go coasting so far that even on our almost 6,000 foot runway, I've thought a couple times a 172 was going to go off the end, you know, and both of those are situations you don't want to be in after you just flew an ILS down to minimums. So this patience thing that we're talking about with energy management, it applies until you are on the ground and stopped. And even at the DA, which seems like the most critical time, you just resist the urge to go making big power and pitch changes. That's the absolute last time to do that. Make a small change and wait. And you'll probably get it just right. Well, yeah. And I think uh, what you're talking about there, too, you never want to destabilize an approach. And what happens is due to the lack of either A, experience or B, ability to manage energy properly, what we're seeing is we see people destabilized approaches. And if you 
destabilize the approach, you're not setting yourself up for success. Exactly. And, and a stabilized approach, as you get into 121 and 135 stuff, that is actual regulatory in nature. And there are little checks that your SOP will have for your airline or your company or whatever about when and where you have to be stabilized by that are you know, in agreement with you know the guidance. But usually it's by 500 feet, I think, or a thousand on a visual or something like that. And uh, I maybe have those backwards, but a stabilized approach is not optional. And it's something that you have to do. And that this energy management that we're talking about is really, I think, the most important key to getting it. Oh, sure. Yes. And, you know, you combine energy management and then you just have to combine patience. And you've got to be consistent. Like you said, you got to be consistent down the path. You're the, you know, the GS. You've got to be on the, right on the glide slope. Because if you're not on the glide slope and you're fighting it and you're up and down like a yo-yo, Every time that nose pitch is down, what do you do? You increase the airspeed. Every time the nose pitch is up, what do you do? You decrease the airspeed. So your speed's not consistent. So you th think your power's off, but really it's just you're, you're fluctuating in pitch. So you just have to be consistent down the glide slope and uh, patient with the airplane and, and, and everything else will work itself out. Yeah. Just be patient enough to know if you really do or don't need to touch those power levers. I mean, that's, that's the, basically the basics of it. Yeah, exactly. Well, our last point here then is thinking ahead of the airplane. And I think this kind of goes right in line with that is, is you're not going to get a stabilized approach. You're not going to get a lot of things unless you're thinking well ahead of the airplane. And obviously the, the faster you're going, the further ahead you sort of have to think, right? But what are you seeing out there in the real world? Well, what I see is I see a lot of reactive things instead of a lot of proactive things. Reactive meaning... Oh, I should have done that. I, I should have already been in this configuration or I should have already had this altitude dialed in. I should have already had, you know, this checklist run. I should have already, you know, X, Y, and Z. And I'll, I'll give you some hard examples. Shoot an ILS approach. When you come across the final approach fix, once the GS turns from white to green or arm to active, whatever you're doing, what do you do? Well, one of the main things you have to do is you set your missed approach altitude in the altitude pre-select if it's not already set in there. Sometimes they coincide with each other. Sometimes they don't. Well, if you don't set that missed approach altitude in your altitude pre-select and you have a go around, guess what? You let that autopilot fly that go around and you do it in FMS mode and you don't have the top altitude in there. Uh, you can get a violation real easy or you can actually run into some terrain if, uh, if it's set too low. So, Thinking ahead of the airplane, you go around and, oh, my God, you've, you know, you've leveled off at 1,800 feet, which was your final approach fix altitude. Oh, no, when the missed approach calls for an altitude of 3,200 feet. So then you level off for a second. Well, that second may not clear your obstacles for you on the other end or, go, or going around. So you've got to be able to think ahead of the airplane and say, oh, well, I forgot to do this. Well, a lot of it is, is that you're just not thinking ahead of the airplane. In other words, yeah, another good, well, actually, another good example would be think ahead of an airplane. Where do I need to be in three minutes? And I usually tell people when I'm teaching in the single engine turboprops, it's usually about three minutes. Sometimes it can be five minutes. You need to be thinking ahead of the airplane. Well, what does that mean? That means this in three minutes, where am I going to be in relation to my landing airport? Since that's always a hot topic. Well, I'm going to be a, on about a five mile final, on about a three mile final, on about a two mile final. Well, if you're going to be on a two mile final in three minutes, that means in three minutes, you need to have your gear down and flaps full. They need to be on speed. They need to be on some kind of a, a pappy, right? Pappy, vazzy, glide slope, depending on what you're doing or what you're working with. Or if you're going into a runway that's not, you need to have a site picture that looks like you're on some sort of a pappy. And you need to be on on speed. So if you're going to think ahead of it, then you've got to react ahead of it. So then you've got to plan accordingly. And a lot of people don't. They're just flying around sightseeing. And then all of a sudden, it, it becomes a situation where it's like, oh, my gosh, I need to have all this stuff done. And then we get into things like poor energy management. Yeah. Do you have any sort of maybe like checkpoints or little things that you know, we could give everyone here that little sort of like an in-range check or triggering events that, that you like to use, be they sort of published or just things that have worked for you over time that can sort of jog your memory. Like for instance, for me, uh, I had a very good instructor once, the, the guy who finished off my private back up in San Jose, who uh, 
he always taught me the five A's, and I really liked this, and I, I give this to, to students now. But when we turn around from the practice area or when you're uh, getting ready to descend or, or something like that, you do ATIS, altimeter, alignment, avionics, setup, and approach brief. And so the first thing you're going to do is as soon as you can get it as far out as possible, you get your ATIS, you know. And at the time, we didn't have ways to do that other than just dialing it up and listening. Now, of course, as we've talked about in so many different ways, you can get that information. But that was the first thing you did. And then that sets you up to set your altimeters. And then this is a good time to check your alignment because, again, we were flying an airplane that had a just a DG in it, you know, nothing nothing fun, no flux gate compass, none of that. And then you could set up your avionics appropriately. So whether you're VFR or IFR, you're going to set up the airport frequencies. You're going to set up uh, maybe the ILS or whatever, depending on if that's going to be a thing. You would set up basically all the frequencies that you needed, all the guidance, put it in the GPS, whatever you want to get yourself as much information as you can with how you're going to approach the airport. And the last setup was, or the last thing was the approach briefing, which is going to complete that for you, of course, because if you get out the, the approach plate, well, that's going to guide you through how to set up your radios and brief it. But if you're just VFR, well, you still need to think about is this a tower airport or not? How am I going to enter the traffic pattern? What's the tower going to finally tell me or so on? And then also you need to think about where that big descent point is. And a previous guest on the show who used to fly for regional airline, uh, RH over from Opposing Bases podcast, we we got into a little bit talking about you know, when he was in the CRJ, for instance, if you're uh, you know, we had the rule of threes, right? It takes about three miles to descend a thousand feet. So you can use that and extrapolate how far out you are and how many thousand feet up you are to see if you've really got a problem. Like if you're at 10,000 feet and you're 30 miles from the airport, that's about the limit of how high you're going to want to be. Unless of course, there's going to be some long downwind base and final maneuvering or something like that. But if you're on a straight in at that altitude, you are already behind the airplane, right? So what do you use for instance, to sort of have little checkpoints along the way to make sure that you're always thinking ahead or if you're not to kind of snap you back? Well, in, it depends on what I'm flying, uh, n- number one. But I think first and foremost, you've, you have to, and I know this is going to sound real cliche when I say this, but there's no substitute for experience. And, and I mean that from coming from one of two ways. I mean that as far as having your rear end in the seat for a certain amount of time, but also being able to get into the right seat and watch someone that is more experienced than you fly out of the left seat. And when you get those two things combined with some observations, you get some pretty good tools to work with. Uh, the, the three, the rule of three that you just talked about is a, that is bar none. Fantastic. I want to say, and don't quote me on this, but I know the air, like you said, a friend of yours that works for the regionals. I know somebody uh, that works for the bigs and they use that when they're shooting a visual approach. And that's how they do the rule of three. Some of the things that, that I do, and I do the rule of three on the descent, you know, also a rule of three, meaning if you have 20,000 feet to lose, multiply 20 by three, you know, that's 60 and that's your mile. So if you got 20,000, you know, feet to lose, you start at, you need 60 miles to do it. And it depends on what you're flying. I mean, if you're in a turbo jet, that's obviously about 2,500 feet a minute, sometimes 3,000. If you're in a turbo prop, that's 12 to 1,500 feet a minute uh, that you need on your descent. You need to be able to think far enough ahead of the airplane to be like, okay, when would I normally start this descent if VNAV and VPATH and all that good stuff aren't available to you as a tool? But even though when that stuff's available to me, I'm always backing that stuff up with the manual rules of three um in my in my mind um also some of the things that that really help is and i stress this to everybody and i stress it and stress it and stress it your checklists do not need to be read and do if you're on the level of a read and do checklist you've got to get past that it's got to be a do and verify situation because if you got your checklist down to do and verify and you've got flows that you were taught for a specific airplane I fly a, one one of the uh, types of airplane I fly. We have a couple flows that are really nice. We have a Giphy check. It's gear, inertial separator, flaps, and yaw damper. It's an excellent check. And then we also have lights, ice, air, flaps, trim, cast. And when we go through those flows, we can back that up with a checklist, but we do it when we verify it. And it happens real fast. 
And I noticed that when the people that I'm teaching don't have these things committed to memory and backed up by a checklist verification, when we're still on the level of picking up a checklist and looking at it and then having to go, oh, where's this lever and where's that button? We have not devoted enough time to the flight deck to get ourselves proficient enough to fly the airplane effectively. So therefore, thinking ahead of the airplane becomes impossible if we don't have the airplane down. So I think it's a combination of, of a number of things, but you know, you bringing up the rule of three, just, I mean, that turns on light bulbs in my head. Yeah. And, and you know, if for anyone listening that, that maybe doesn't have the opportunity to fly with uh, an instructor that's got turbine time and a fair amount of it, you know, be it 121 or 135 or, or other, one of the places I recommend people go is to check out those just planes videos. You can get them on YouTube, you can buy them, whatever, but you know, it's literally just, I hate to say airplane porn, but it's somebody sitting in the cockpit you know, filming from multiple angles, a crew flying a trip in an airliner. And you can see them from multiple different countries, uh, be it, not too many U.S. because a lot of U.S. carriers have, have issues with that. But, I mean, they've done like 10 of them with Air France. They've done a whole bunch of them with Ethiopian. They've done a ton of them with Iberia. They've done a ton of them, you know, with all kinds of airlines from all over the world, even down to um, right here in California, we had Surf Air and the Pilatuses. So, I mean, they've got a ton of just raw footage of people and cr air crews flying these trips. And you can see exactly what Chad's talking about because you're going to see the crew going, okay, so it's uh, ready to push back. Everybody's arms go do their little flow check, going through the overhead panel, down to the side, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Captain calls checklist. And then it's read, verify. And then that's it. So it just takes a second. This, done, this, blah, 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 blah. There's a response. We all know what it is. And that's it. So the actual holding a piece of paper portion of the checklist took all of like four seconds he puts it right back there on the on the glare shield but that's because everybody had the carefully choreographed flow that they did first and it was do verify there are very few times except for of course in emergencies where there's perhaps a long procedure to go through where it's going to be a read and do checklist the run-up sure you can do that read do that's fine but anytime you're in the air it would behoove you to know exactly what you need to do and then use a checklist because guess what? That's why it's called that. It's not a do list. It's a checklist to check that you did all those things from memory. And even in emergencies, there's going to be a few parts of it that are memory. Then you check that you did those, then go into the little flow chart of how to try to troubleshoot it or fix it. Right. You know, that's, that is exactly right. You know, it, unless it's an abnormal procedure, emergency or abnormal, which I think that's, that's what you're talking about, a master caution, master warning light, or something that requires you to dig into the book outside of the normal memory items associated with a certain situation. It's, it's always, it's do and verify. It takes four seconds. Uh, if, if you're on the read and do level, you're not on the, it, it's not the, the right place to be. And w when you get into the do and verify and you, you get into those four, that four second check and you get into exactly what you're talking about, uh, now you're getting into being able to think ahead of the airplane. And here is another situation that, that you mentioned, but I think you just mentioned it indirectly. And I was, I was thinking about it and I failed to mention it. I didn't, you know, people look at people and say, oh, you know, you're really good in this airplane. You're really good in that airplane. You're really good. Well, I'll tell you what, I did not get get proficient. We'll just say proficient because I'll let other people judge whether I'm, I'm good or not. I won't say that or, or whatever, because I, I like to start every day like I'm in a basement and work my way out of it and uh, in, in everything and not get complacent. So I'm, I'm constantly trying to work and improve on my uh, skill level and abilities, uh, just like uh, anyone else that I believe uh, truly loves this profession would do. And, and but one of the things that that I think is ex extremely important is, is to note that I did not get as proficient in airplanes as I did in the left seat. I got proficient in airplanes in the right seat. In the right seat of an airplane is where you really learn an airplane because you get to sit in the teaching environment and see the mistakes that you make mentally and the mistakes that the person in the left seat makes. And in the two crew environment or the two, or the two, the two crew environment, or the two pilot airplane environment, because there is a difference. Some single pilot airplanes, they, they put two crew in them, uh, you know, and, and they're actually two crew airplanes that carry a single pilot authorization, but we won't get into that whole deal. But some of those airplanes, they, they've got two crew and I flew a lot of that or planes that require two pilots. I got, I got proficient in those airplanes in the right seat, not in the left seat. 
And I think it's important for people to know that we all don't have that ability maybe to do that. But once in a while, if somebody's out there listening and you really, really, really want to do something cool, put your flight instructor in the left seat and you sit in the right seat and you do what the flight instructor would do. And you just let the flight instructor guide the airplane around and you sit, take that right seat job and you work the radios and you do the nav and you pull the gear and you, you handle the flaps and, and, and just try something new, new, for example. And you can see kind of what is seen from the right seat and, and it'll give you a whole new perspective. Yeah. Once you take that pressure off of being in the hot seat all the time and change your perspective, it's just like taking a break when you've been sitting down writing for an hour and a half and you just need to go get a breath of fresh air, change the perspective. And, and it's amazing what you're going to learn. And I think you're talking to every CFI listening to this right now, because I feel like that's when I finally sort of quote unquote got it. Like that's when I got the big picture was when I got to sit there and I wasn't the one manipulating the controls. I got to sit there and watch everybody else make all the mistakes. I got to see somebody else do it. I got to feel that sort of cringing feeling where I'm like, right rudder, right rudder, right rudder, here here comes a spin. You know, and, and, and through viscerally having those experiences, I think that's what really completes you and that's what makes you proficient. And then when I got back over to the left, it, it was just amazing. I, I felt like I, it didn't look the same. It didn't feel the same. I spent, you know, three, 400 hours in the right seat before I flew from the left seat again, for whatever reason. And I remember that day still, because it just was not the same to be in the left seat of an airplane again. And then once you got to the point, you know, where you've been a CFI for a couple of years and you've probably given at that point, maybe even a couple thousand hours of instruction, when you train another CFI, that to me was sort of the, the icing on the cake of my instructor career was, when I got to hand it over to other people that I had seen come from a private pilot all the way through being a CFI. And then I was in fact in the left seat and they're instructing me from the right. And we both got to touch the controls. We both got to have these high level discussions kind of like you and I are doing right now. And, and that like completed my general aviation, at least sort of piston aircraft picture and put a bow on it before I could move on to other things. Because exactly what you said is so spot on that when you're, getting it from the other side, it just changes your whole perspective. And that's when you really, really, really learn and really get proficient. You know, that's, and it's so true. I mean, I can't tell you how, how many thousands of hours, you know, I say thousands, but how many hours I had or whatever in it, how much more valuable my non thousands of hours in the right seat are than my thousands of hours in the left seat are. And when I started out, uh, flying professionally, I started out flying in the right seat of King Airs, and I got to fly with some really, really, really good captains. One was a retired air traffic controller, Fort Worth Center controller, really awesome guy. And he, and one of the cool things was, once I got, he got my confidence out of the right seat. He liked to talk on the radio, so guess what seat he liked? Because he was a former controller. He's like Chad, you fly. Well. I didn't learn as much I, flying as I did watching, you know, and I got good watching before I got, you know, I got good or proficient watching uh, Mark flying airplane versus getting over there and doing it myself. So in watching him fly was invaluable. And then when I got over there to fly, I was okay because I knew what not to do and I knew what to do. And, and, and he was good enough where he didn't make many mistakes, which, which was good. So he got to call me out on mine. But e even when I flew with some of the other captains, uh, you know, coming up the ranks with still, they, I mean, they were phenomenal and I got to sit over there and watch. So when I got over there in the left seat, it was, uh, it, it was good. And what we don't have in GA is sometimes we don't have that uh, owner flown experience that wants to sit in the right seat and let the instructor in the left seat fly. And I think there's a great disservice being done because uh, some of that does not take place when it's, it's very hard sometimes to show someone how to fly in the left seat from the right seat, if that makes sense. Absolutely. And when I see that owner over there cringing when he thinks I'm too fast, but right on glide path, and, and I know that he's just fighting the urge to grab the stick and pull up, I'm like, no, watch how this is going to transpire. Just cringe and be patient 
and you're going to see it work. And, and it blew his mind. I mean, just something that simple, he changed his whole, you know, 50 years of flying was changed in that moment because he got to viscerally feel that uncomfortability over what was actually quite normal. Oh, sure. And, it, and it, I've got a couple owners that I fly with that have no problems with, you know, hopping over in the right seat and in this and that. And, you know, they're, they've turned themselves into really good pilots uh, over the years. And, it, and it's fun to watch or watch them grow and, and, and watch people develop a, as a pilot. I think it's one of the more rewarding things that being a flight instructor is the most rewarding thing is being able to see somebody increase their ability, their piloting ability, proficiency, whatever you want to call it, to the point where, you know, hey, you know, this person has progressed to the point where it's now time to really start working on your commercial license. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, to round us out here, I have a listener question I thought maybe we could answer together. What do you think of that? Hey, I think that sounds great. All right. This one comes from show supporter Hans Cathcart. He says, hi, Brandon. I fly in NorCal where I'm pretty familiar with the peculiarities of the airspace. But today I had a chance to fly in the Los Angeles Basin for the first time. And after an uneventful Victorville to Riverside flight, I departed Riverside only 27 on a roughly 265 heading towards Santa Monica. Shortly after being handed to SoCal, I was reprimanded for getting too close to the quote unquote approach corridor. Having LAX's approach in mind and being careful not to get too close to Ontario, I was totally perplexed, so I followed ATC heading instructions blindly, and in a personal post-flight, I sort of realized that ATC probably hadn't meant LAX, but Chino's approach. Okay, I'm sorry. However, Riverside's tower hadn't given me an on-course heading, and then I advised him where I was going. Most Riverside pilots probably know the weird angle with which 27 points right at Chino's 26 approach, but transient pilots would of course have no clue unless they intimately studied all the runway angles and so forth. There's nothing in the airport comments, nor could I find any Riverside noise abatement procedures, so looking at the instrument procedures wouldn't have really helped because the missed approach fix was even closer to Chino's approach. So I don't want you to arbitrate, you're not my CFI after all, but uh, as it says in the disclaimer, your thoughts though are more than welcome. And uh, what I'd like to ask is, how do I learn from this? Should I give a call to the Riverside Tower? Should I call the Tracon? Or are there any good pilot to controller forums like on Facebook where such questions can be discussed? And how do we help pass potentially tribal knowledge like this to transient pilots? Thank you and hope you're holding up well during COVID-19. So first off to those last couple quick points so that I don't forget. Yes, there are uh, actually several forums, uh, one that I'm in is ask a pilot slash air traffic controller on Facebook. And to anybody who listens to this, that's not part of that, I recommend that you do become part of it. And, uh, you know, there probably are some local tribal knowledge places too, like you could talk to the local CFIs and so on, but of course that would be for a transient pilot. I mean, unreasonable. So what I wrote back to him and, and you can pick this one apart, Chad, but I said, Hans, I wish there was a simple answer to all this. Obviously the FAA reg is that you have to become familiar with all information pertaining to the flight. But I mean, let's be reasonable. What does that really mean? It's a little bit ambiguous. And I mean, you can't really know everything about everything, right? But we do our best. So obviously that may be impossible. But one thing that's not mentioned in there is that uh, controller's personal opinions be taken into account, right? So the short answer to the question, unfortunately, is that there isn't really an answer. But we always need to be vigilant when near a final approach corridor. But I mean, that could be 10, 15, 20 miles long, right? So we'll get into it more on the show. But my recommendation is that you always get flight following on the ground if you can. And SoCal area towers are usually really great about this. And uh, it can really help out a lot. And I preach that, of course, to all my students. And I type in probably 50 flight following requests every single shift I do at the tower. Anyway, great question, though. And I hope that helps. And we'll talk about it on the show. Quick follow-up. He emailed me back that uh, he tried calling the safety and training departments uh, down at the TRACON. But, of course, during COVID, that was harder to reach. So uh, no harm, no foul there. But uh, he ended up speaking with someone at a flight school at the Riverside Airport, and they just advised him to file IFR. But he did confirm the instinct that VFR flight falling with the tower was the right thing to do. And that's what I also said. And the flyway chart depicts a route that takes you under the Bravo, which was his intention to fly, but he could have been given more precise instructions on where to join it. But he gets a sense that controllers are chain- trained to look for things out of the ordinary. And if you don't fly exactly where they anticipate you on the flyway, even if you're in contact, they're going to try to guide you. In this case, the controller's reprimand did make him go back and try to understand later and learn, which is a good thing. But at the time of the flight, I feel that ATC could have just given me a heading and altitude without all the drama. Chad, what say you? Well, 
I think you got a number of things, go, you know, going on here. Um, I'm, I'm with you, Brandon. I think, you know, get your tower and root, go VFR is fine. Uh, no need to file IFR in this case. Uh, if uh, you're ever unsure, uh, you, you've got to ask a controller back is what I would say, because this is, this, this is kind of what I do, but again, experience will dictate uh, what you do as a PIC. I, if I was unsure, I would say I need a heading and altitude. I need this or I need that. Um, you know, the, the controllers are 99 times out of 100. They're going to be willing to help you out uh, based on my experience. So I would definitely ask for a heading and altitude or ask what do you need or ask, uh, get more specific with ATC if, if you don't understand. One of the things that I've learned in aviation is never assume. If you assume it's probably not going to be the right thing, you need to know. It's kind of like three green lights and a landing gear. Only guarantee we have is three green lights, and that guarantees the gear down. Anything else is a non-guarantee. So uh, an assumption is probably not something that something to go with. So anytime in your mind as you're flying along, as a PIC of any aircraft, if you assume something but could ask. My advice is you need to ask because the assumption may be not what they're thinking. Yeah, I agree with that. And again, you know, out here in the Southern California airspace, it is just the most congested, close together, backwards, things pointing at each other, chunk of airspace probably there that there really is anywhere else, save for maybe, you know, New York or something like that. But even where he's used to in the Bay Area, things kind of tend to, I hate to say, follow a little more of a pattern, but all the runways are at least pointed the same direction. Well... I now that we have this follow up information with him, you know, Hans, I hope that as you listen to this, you're you're not feeling like you did really anything wrong. You know, everybody has little pet peeves when they're controlling traffic. Controllers do that is. And that area where in that sector, I, I've never worked it, but I mean, I've, I've sat there and seen it. It is a very, very, very frustrating and congested sector to have to work. And to everybody who does work in that area uh, of, of SoCal, I mean, my my hat's off to you. That's that's about as tough as it gets. It's nothing but practice approaches in opposite directions and you're surrounded by mountains in every direction. So they, they do have it tough. And I think maybe the guy was just having a bad day. So uh, it's unfortunate that it happened that way, but I think that you, you have learned out of it. You, you've come out of this knowing the right thing to do is get flight following, or you could go IFR if you wanted. But frankly, I like your point, Chad, is just ask. I mean, at that point, if, if you're not really sure what you've done wrong, which is entirely reasonable, then yeah, just ask for heading in an altitude. And it shouldn't be a problem. Absolutely. So. All right, Chad. Well, this has been yet another just deep, well, about seven deep dives I think we did here. And I, I tell you, what, I'm going to break this probably into two episodes because I think my brain is starting to melt at this point. But uh, I want to thank you for not only coming back on the show, but for just giving out this amount of knowledge that you have and sharing it with everybody. And if people want to get in touch with you or ask you something else or learn from you, how could they do that? Well, you can always send me an email. Uh, my email address is flyboy, like an airplane. It's flyboy1231 at gmail.com. Awesome. Well, let's tell you what, after this whole thing's over, I can't wait to uh, hang out again and fly and share more stories in the logbook from that. And you will definitely be on the show again as soon as we can make that happen, man. Oh, absolutely. It's always my pleasure. Again, I really appreciate you having me. And I uh, can't wait to make it out to California sometime this year so you and I can get there up the skies. Man, you know, Chad and I talked for so long that when I looked down at the recording at the end, it showed nearly two hours. And I think that's actually the best part of aviation, right? Podcasting too, actually. The idea that we can get all into a bunch of different topics and go with it for that long and not only have a great time, but share a ton of useful information with everybody else too. And I'm sure you've got at least one opinion on something you've heard today, right? So if you want to weigh in, shoot me an email, brandon at podcastingonaplane.com. Chad and I would love to hear from you. Or better yet, you can always use your smartphone or the SpeakPipe widget that pops up when you visit podcastingonaplane.com to record me something. And who knows, maybe I'll even put it on the show. And hey, while you're on the website, maybe consider supporting the show too. Because if you find value in it, I really appreciate having you on board as a patron. You get episodes early and sometimes other fun stuff too. Or if you're not into the recurring thing, Maybe head over to buymeacoffee.com forward slash Bravo Golf spelled out, and you can do the one-time thing in increments of just three bucks. And whether you're flying or not right now, you want to stay sharp on the mic, right? So make sure to use the affiliate code Delta at plainenglishsim.com, and you get 10% off the best smartphone-based ATC radio communication simulator around. 
Link, of course, is in the show notes. And as always, I thank you so much for your support in whatever form it takes and for listening to the show and passing the word along about this or really any of your aviation podcasts to a friend. And you know what? I practice what I preach, so I'm going to shout out a couple of my favorite aviation podcasts right now. Let's do some plugs. Friends and professionals in the industry that I want to recognize and maybe that have even helped me with this show or that I've been able to contribute to in some meaningful way as well. So big shout outs to Captain Jeff and the Airline Pilot Guy crew, RH and AG over at Opposing Bases, Max Trescott at Aviation News Talk, and oh, so many printed guidelines and publications and podcasts too, right? Rob Mark, of course, from Flying Magazine and JetWine.com. And rounding out our little aviation podcaster friend group, Dispatcher Mike over at Acme and Flying in Life. Those are all my go-to aviation podcasts, and they should be yours too. And hey, if there's some new ones out there that I don't know about, shoot me an email. I'd love to hear about it. That's all for now. Your frequency change is approved until next time, and report back on this frequency for the next episode. Good day. Podcasting on a Plane podcast is presented for entertainment purposes only. Brandon's comments and those of his guests, the website's content and any of the social media, etc. are not part of his official responsibility as a controller or as an FAA employee. The views and opinions you hear on the podcast are his and those of his guests and not necessarily that of the FAA. Also, while he's a CFI, he's not acting as your CFI, nor is he your mechanic, your doctor, your shrink or your spouse. This podcast is presented for entertainment, camaraderie and fun, but is in no way, shape or form professional advice or legal counsel. If you're in need of professional advice, get some from somewhere more appropriate than a podcast, no matter how good this one may be.